Welcome to EIPIP meeting 40. Um, I have shared agenda in the chat. The first item listed here is adding execution clients information at execution dash specs. Uh, so for people who may have missed it earlier, in the last all core dev meetings, it was announced uh, that uh, we have renamed a few GitHub repository and Discord channels. Uh, the one that we usually refer to in this meeting is a eth1.o specs repository, which is now renamed as execution specs. I just added this item to um, feel like, how do people think about adding information of execution clients uh, at the execution specs? Uh, like I'm not aware of any particular placeholder where we can get all this information like website, GitHub link or latest version listed there for a new user to refer to. So what do people think generally on this proposal? Um, I'm bored. Okay. Not I, I generally don't care what happens in that repo. <laughs> No, my understanding is like people who wants to follow the upgrade or someone who is interested in running, uh, setting up a new client or that. So if we can make it a like proper information sharing place holder, that would be helpful for people. Okay. Seems fine to me. Cool. Right. So um, I suppose the small crowd do not think that uh, there's an issue with that. So let's keep it positive. Uh, uh, I don't see Tim on the call today. Uh, maybe we would like to mention it to him uh, or check with the core devs if they have any objection. If not, we'll start filling up with the primary information. I don't think we need to check with Tim. I think he's okay with it. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is for clients information. So clients should be usually okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Sounds good. So yeah, I, I can look into adding primary information of the clients. Do we have any particular like place for that or readme should be fine? Yeah, the readme is, is good. All right. Uh, then we can do that. Uh, moving on to the next item, it is update EIP editors. I have uh, referred an issue there, which I found on the um, EIP's GitHub repository. So at the moment, uh, the present EIP one shows uh, 10 EIP editors, though we do not have all of them being very active. Uh, so I was looking into the history and um, Particularly three, I found a name that I have not seen at least for a year, number two, number five, and number six. So um, I was wondering like, do we need to have these people here listed and like get them pinged every time though they are not actively involved or is it the right time to update the EIP one? It would be nice. Yeah. I'm conflicted. So um, it definitely would be nice if we had a list of EIP editors that was actually like accurate <laughs> and active. Um, like for example, if you were to ping Casey Detrio about something EIP related, uh, you would not get any help, right? And so have, having a list of editors that were like, if a user is new, they're going to just start from the top of the list and start pinging people until they get an answer. And they won't actually get an answer until they get very far down the list because the active editors are the ones at the bottom. Um, that being said, like that list of people is basically the list of people who have merge rights and have a voice. And so uh, while I would like to pare that down to the people who are actively participating, at the same time, I don't want to like forcibly kick anybody out. And so that's why I'm conflicted. Um, because I would like that list to accurately represent who the editors are, and I would like the editors to be the set of people who are actively involved in editing. 
And at the moment, that's like two and a half of the people on this list meet that, I would say. <laughs> that's um, funny. But again, I'm... <laughs> I'm generally not a fan of just like, especially since, you know, I, I'm one of those two and a half people. Um, I'm generally not a fan of like using that power and saying, okay, I'm kicking out everybody else who could challenge me. And now it's just me in charge. <laughs> uh, so that's why I'm conflicted. Like if I was a external third party, I would say kick out everybody, but uh, Micah, Matt and Alex, um, because everybody else hasn't shown up to a meeting and haven't, hasn't contributed significantly to the editing process or decision making or actively editing um, for like a year. Um, but because I'm in the process, I am very hesitant to actually make that recommendation because it might be just my biases seeking to secretly gain power. Happy to say it's not just you. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to split the list. Like I don't think we should delete them, but just have like a section saying they're inactive or emeritus is the fancy word for that, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Any other thought on that? It, it doesn't really feel like we need to do anything. Like, I don't think people are realistically pinging Casey to merge things. So it kind of feels like we're just like, yes, on the face, it seems like a nice thing because we are in the process and we know who's involved and we look at EIP one, but in reality, no one else looks at EIP one or the list of editors. Yeah. True story. Yeah, right. Um, I just picked it up from the issues section where someone has actually requested to get it updated. And uh, like on occasions I have seen people listing all of those people like uh, listed on the EIP editors. And I think uh, uh, I like both the idea of having it like, you know, um, most active people on the top and like uh, then go downwards and people who are not actively involved. I do, I'm not sure if their IDs are even like, you know, valid or they should be pinged. So we can update if, if, if no one has a strong objection at least uh, three names I can see here, uh, number two, number five, and number six, uh, which I have not seen for over a year. We can do that. And uh, I, I don't think, I mean, it, it, should be, it should be personal to anyone because I'm not an EIP editor. I think I can speak for it. Like Micah said that he wants to secretly gain all the power. <laughs> so um, if there is no general, like, you know, strong opposition on that, we can probably update the list. I have no opposition. And while you're in there, if you just want to remove my name too, I would not oppose. <laughs> we can't do that. We want to like <laughs> process go smoothly. <laughs> we cannot lose one of two and a half at EIP editors. Okay. Worth a shot. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we are good and we'll try to go ahead and clean up this EIP one and that would be good because we are making a lot of changes. This would be one of those. And um, I, I think uh, having uh, this sorted out will help many new people who are trying to enter the process and document some of the proposals to be a standard for Ethereum. Moving on to the item number three. Um, so I'm happy to share that uh, a number of open pull requests are now below 25. Like it was like big number earlier, but having it below 25 is very good progress, I can say. Uh, now we have more EIP editors actively involved. Like we have at least half more. We are making good progress in this direction. And um, I am a little concerned about the open issues because as of today, the number shows 485 open issues, like which is significantly high. I'm wondering how we can decrease this number and make this repo look good and invite participation to address real issues, like issues we actually want to discuss and you know get resolved. So I have listed quite a few issues uh, from that uh, repository. And uh, if that's okay, Sorry. we can. Yeah, please. 
I think that in order to get the issue count down, we would have to first um, stop encouraging and or allowing people to have discussion to links be right. in the issues. Right now, our policy is to say either create a magician's thread or create a GitHub issue for discussions too. Um, as long as we have that policy, there will always be, I think, a large number of open issues. Um, also, we tell people to start the EIP process by creating an issue to discuss it. And so I think as long as those two things are present, we're never going to get the issues down to close to zero. Like it'll always be a big number. And so my strategy has thus far been to just ignore that number um, and just basically ignore all issues in general. Uh, I'm not against changing that, though there's some caveats there. Like um, we don't necessarily want to force everybody to create accounts at other services like they already had to create a GitHub account. We don't want to necessarily make them go create an account somewhere else just to create an EIP, which is why we allow them to do GitHub issues. Um, I think GitHub now has a discussions feature that maybe we could use instead, which maybe is more appropriate. I don't know. Yes, uh, uh, that was on my list, like the how to address issues. Like number one is like discussion tool link. Um, I, I think uh, we have made some changes to reflect that discussion to link should be the fellowship of Ethereum magician because that is the place where most of the uh, devs are hanging out to discuss any of the issue. And sooner or later, if we have like central place for discussion, I think is going to be good, not only to get discussed that particular proposal, but to look into other issues which are like, you know, being discussed in the ecosystem. And the number two would be address and close open issues, uh, like the issues that those are not like, you know, uh, even if the pull request is done, that is a standard or have been rejected, but they are still there. So we might have to look into each one of those. Um, I hear Micah on, on thought of like uh, um, not forcing people to have another account to create a discussion to link. But um, um, as much as I agree, I feel that like having a central place for discussion is also good. Um, I'm curious if people have different thoughts. So when we instituted that policy, GitHub discussions did not exist. GitHub discussions now exist. Does it make sense to keep discussion to links in GitHub discussions and just stop recommending people go to Ethereum magicians? So, so we'd achieve the goal of a single central place. It's just that central place would be GitHub discussions, not GitHub issues, not Ethereum magicians. Have you used GitHub discussions at all? Yeah, I'm very cautious just because it's a new feature. Like, what if they can it in three months? Because it's not a good feature. Um, I would. What's the reason we don't send people just to eat magicians? Um, we want to encourage. We want to, I should say, support um, pseudo anonymity. And the more accounts you have to create at various places, the more difficult that becomes. And so, but allowing people to in just have a single GitHub. account. Yeah, I log okay, in with GitHub, 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 which is, yeah, that's what I do. Uh, do you know what they ask for? Ethereum. Uh, what the. Uh... I'm not sure. Uh, I can try to log out and log back in, see if it gives me a prompt or something. Uh, uh, it, won't, it won't give you one because you've already approved, but I haven't approved, so I can log out and log in and find out. Yeah. Give me one second. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I don't know, I would rather move stuff to like a platform that we own as like a, you know, bias towards that. Like, obviously, we still need to use GitHub, um, but um, yeah. So at a glance, it looks like it asks for email address. Um, do we know, can we make it so Ethereum Magicians doesn't ask for an email address? Like, that seems unnecessary. If you sign in with GitHub? Yeah. It has an irrevocable permission for email address. It's unfortunate. I can ask uh, Jamie. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, I'd say let's find that out. If we can remove the email address requirement, then I see absolutely no problem. With the email address requ requirement, 
Yeah. Um, like I can see the argument for why do I have to give my email address to some service that I may not trust. Um, GitHub is you know well established. Ethereum magicians not so much, and so you know the fewer people you have to give your email address out to, the better in theory. If you're trying to remain kind of anonymous, um, now that's the general argument. I mean this it's it's not a super strong argument, but I can appreciate it. Like there are people in this space who prefer anonymity. And yet they also contribute. Like it's not like we just want to do it for the sake of of doing it. There are people who I've seen contribute meaningfully that don't like giving out their email address or their picture or whatever. Yep, that makes sense. I, I just pick Jamie or let you all know when I hear back. Okay. On that, uh, my personal thought is like, uh, there are only a few proposal which actually needs like a detailed discussion. And most of the proposals, they are good with like uh, the pull request GitHub discussion only. Although I, I prefer that it, it is always good to have central place for discussion. Let's see what uh, what it goes with the fellowship of Ethereum magician, but people at, at the moment, they, they do provide a email address to GitHub. Um, and like they have one, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, one place where we are discussing it. So if, if there is like uh, no strong opposition by any particular author, like we want to have it on the GitHub issue to be discussed, I think it makes sense to either continue discussion in Fellowship of Ethereum Magician, or if there is like small discussion needed, we and addressing just concern that needs to be fixed before the proposal can be moved to different status that can be addressed in the pull request section too. I think you mean issues section. Really no, almost no discussion should happen in the pull request because they are transient, they go away. Well, sort of. <laughs> right. Closed. Um, right. Yeah, so I'm, the I'm totally, I'm totally fine with strongly recommending everybody uses Ethereum Magicians. We have not in the past. I'm fine with changing that. I do like the idea of giving people an option that doesn't require them to dox themselves slightly more. Agree. It's like a, I'm, I'm hesitant to remove the option of GitHub issues for the requirement uh, because that, what that requirement boils down to is in order to create a pull request, you must give the Ethereum Foundation your email address more or less. And at least that's, that's how some people see it. And uh, it'd be nice if we can, you know, remain incredibly neutral and say, you know, you're not required to give us your email address, though. We would really like it because we would prefer discussion to happen there. And if we can remove that requirement, then that whole argument goes away. And I have zero problem then. To be fair, like, uh, I see like very small number of people who may have like, uh, not created an account with Fellowship of Ethereum Magician, but even if there is one user, we should respect their privacy. I'm not saying that we should force them to do that. But I think in general, recommending, making it a strong recommendation going for Fellowship of Ethereum Magician may, uh, you know, in future, help us people adopt this as a part of process and like, they'll be fine with that. Yep, works for me. Okay, um, so uh, I had listed here quite a few issues which I found that like either may not be relevant to the present date or maybe something that, you know, uh, we need to take a decision whether it should be there or should be closed. So my, my question here is for EIP editors, of course, like at what point we think that these issues are not relevant and should be closed because we have like limited number of people actually looking into it and leaving comments. So, I think my gut reaction is we just follow the same strategy for stagnant. So, um, if if there's six months with no discussion on an issue like this where the user is proposing some new idea, um, then we close it. Uh, separately, there are, if it's a discussion too for an EIP that has gone stagnant or has gone final, we close it, which I think would handle all these, right? 
well, eventually we'll handle all these. Yeah, it's kind of hard to enforce. How do you mean? I mean, just tedious or? Uh, I mean, of course, we could write a boss to do it, but that would be not very easy. Uh, sure. So I guess from a policy standpoint, I, I think what I described is defined policy. I, I have no intention of actually <laughs> upholding that policy. Um, but if someone wanted to, like if Puja was browsing and noticed one, um, I would have no problem with implementing that, someone implementing that policy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I was more looking towards what policy should be. And these both looks like very good suggestion. The one that we are using for a stagnant on the pull request, the same can be applied on that. I don't know if, if it is technically feasible or not, but uh, I know Alita, you had implemented some bot for the pull request section. I would be curious to know your thought if the same logic can be applied here to reduce this number. Oh, sorry. Alita has a mic issue uh, she mentioned earlier in the call. So maybe we'll get back to it later. But in general, uh, policy wise, do people have uh, uh, like, you know, different thought? I think uh, in chat, she just mentioned that yes, it is possible and it can be applied probably. Uh, so yeah, uh, the two points that Micah mentioned was if EIP idea is six months with no discussion, close as a stagnant. If EIP discussion to issue, then we have to close it. And if EIP is a stagnant, withdrawn or final. Right, I think this will significantly lower down the number because there are many uh, proposals uh, which are actually closed. They are in final status and their issue still lives there. So yes, so, so, assuming someone actually goes through and you know, implements that policy, I think it, I agree. It will lower number a lot. Yeah, I think the first step here would be like if the bot leaves a comment that if there is no further action, it will be closed within a week time or so. I am assuming that an author may respond if they are really interested into that. However, manually, whatever can be done for the issues which which like, you know, which are new, but uh, they may not be the right fit for this particular place. So I'll try to leave a comment on that. And like, you know, we have people, we can do that. And uh, for uh, like in general response to bot, I think we'll get some response and that would be helpful. So there is this one issue, which is a number 3604. Um, I am curious to know if there is any update on that. I know it was brought into community's attention a while ago. It's about update mobile layout to wrap versus overflow. Um, I'm not sure if this has already been addressed or if this is something that can be considered for engineering. Uh. I'm pretty confident that their problem is Safari or iOS. Um, for those who don't know, iOS requires all browsers to be Safari. Even Chrome and Firefox on iOS are just Safari wrappers. It, uh, you'll get blacklisted from the App Store if you try to provide iOS users any other browser. Unfortunately, Safari um, is very non-standard. They are the for, for those of you that have been around the web for a while, um, they're the equivalent of IE6 now. Like they don't implement things right and they're very slow to implement things and they just cause problems. Anyway, the, uh, this person said they're having some rendering problems, um, which you know is a reasonable complaint, um, but I don't have a iOS device to reproduce. So I am unable to verify what they're claiming, um, which also makes it hard to troubleshoot and fix. So, so yes, this is potentially an engineering problem that could be solved by engineering. Um, step one, though, is just to reproduce it. Like someone with an iOS phone needs to try and see if they can reproduce this problem. Do you have a link to the issue or something like like yeah, it's, in, it's in the agenda. The number is three six zero four. Three six zero four. Okay, I can look at it right now. That as well. 
So yeah, there's definitely a technical problem. Um, just a, basically a incompatibility in the UI with Safari is my guess. It could be something else, but um, the person's screenshot indicates that it's Safari. The rendering is definitely wrong. Like that, that is not what it's supposed to look like. Um, so yeah, so we just need to reproduce it. Step one, verify the, the cause of the problem and then fix. Um, I mean, part of the reason I haven't done it is because I hate Safari and I refuse to support anybody who uses that terrible browser. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it seems to work I... fine on Safari. Maybe it's just like the code when there's code sections or something. But... Yes, it's breaking on the Maybe code you... section only, yeah. Yeah, it's fine for Check out e, uh, EIP 721. Um, sure. That's the one the user reported was the problem. Yeah. And if it doesn't break for you, then I'm OK with closing that as could not reproduce. Yeah. It can just buy a new phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <great. laughs> that's, how you, that's how you upgrade your, your browser, right? Yeah. That's a good kind of solution we are sharing here. <laughs> OK. OK, uh, so yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll try to leave a comment. I mean, like, if, if any other user do not face the same problem, even I will try to check it on my cell phone and then leave a comment in case it is like individual's problem, then, uh, then maybe uh, this issue can be closed. Um, so uh, similar to that, like that is the one, um, like we don't know what's going on, like should it be open or not? I mean, should should it be closed? There is another issue, uh, I'm sharing the link, the number is 3548, which I think was related to uh, 1559, uh, the proposal. Uh, now that this is final and this thing, uh, this issue seems to be old. I'm not sure, should there be any policy of just closing it or how do we go about it? Uh, so this is, this is one of the examples where it's um, basically someone has an idea for an EIP and they're following the proper instructions, which is to start from um, a, an, EI, an issue and get feedback. And so this is where I'd say follow the process we described above. So six months, no comments, close it as stagnant. And that will be in like October, November or something. Yeah, that can be an approach to handle these issues. OK, um, do we want to go by all these proposals and make a decision like, is it the right time to close it or? Uh, I'd say let's start by just following the procedure we described. And I'm totally fine with someone else just taking that up and making a call on, on them. Um, the key is, is there's most issues will fall into one of two categories. It's an EIP idea. And those in those cases, it's someone who has an idea and they're proposing it to the broader Ethereum community for discussion. So they're just saying, hey, here's an idea, let's talk. Sometimes people format this like in the EIP. So it kind of like it's an issue, but it's like got the EIP sections. Um, the same, same thing. So these are just people with ideas for EIPs that are not yet draft EIPs. They're just good ideas. Um, for those cases, just if it's been six months when no one's commented, we'll close it as stagnant. And again, I'm totally okay with whoever takes this task on just handling that themselves. I don't think we need to get like unanimous decision. Um, worst case scenario, someone closes what's the name incorrectly, we just reopen it. The other issue to look for is ones that are the discussion too. So if the, usually someone will say in like the link title, in the title or something, they'll say discussion two for EIP one, two, three, four. Um, or something along those lines. And th those ones are usually pretty obvious. They usually have a link to the EIP. And it says somewhere in there, this is the discussion to link. And for those ones, we just would have to check the EIP that they're referring to. If it is in one of the, the kind of terminal-ish states, so, such as final withdrawn or stagnant or abandoned, abandoned, whatever we called it, then we would close. And if it's not, we'd leave it open. And again, same thing. The first one, whoever handles this task, I'm totally fine with them just taking ownership and dealing with it all. Um, I don't think we need to run it by the whole group. That makes sense. I think there is, uh, I mean, like if this is a uh, different category here, I, I have just shared the number. PR number is 
three six. So they just write it like, will that be in just idea category? And we can do the same thing because it's difficult to actually get what they actually want to do with this. Like, do they want to create mean, an EIP? Which which one three six one nine? Three six three six decentralized blacklist. Three six three six. One second. Yeah, so this one looks like an idea. So this is basically someone who's saying, hey, here's an idea, and they want to turn it. Their plan was presumably to turn it into a standard. So this would follow the rules for six months, no comments, close this stagnant. OK. And you can usually tell this is an idea. Just like if someone's just describing like a, some solution to a thing, um, those are just all, in, in my opinion, fall into the category of um, ideas that people have. The, people format them differently. There's all sorts of. Like some people format it like this, some people format it like an EIP, some people just like, it's just a couple of paragraphs. Um, so the format differs, but they all generally have the same theme of someone is describing a solution to a problem. Right, that makes sense. Cool. So um, I'll look into some of those and uh, I don't know, uh, we can check on the feasibility of getting it done with the help of bot. And uh, yeah, we'll come back on this again. Anything else before we move on to the next topic? Not for me. Okay. So the next one is EIP ERC editors in training progress. Uh, we had this meeting uh, yesterday. We, uh, there were over a dozen of proposals which were like reviewed and light client and William left some comments on that. One particular pull request that uh, I want to bring it here is number 3551. I just have shared the link here. So uh, the question that we were trying to discuss here was like this proposal is actually uh, proposed as an informational EIP but uh, editors think that it could be an ERC. So what uh, is like, you know, the general next uh, step? Uh, what is the role of editor here? Like, do we need to strongly recommend to change it to ERC? How flexible we are? Like, okay, totally on the author, whatever way they want to do that. Any thoughts here? I don't have strong opinions about the training process. I've been out of the loop on that. Um, yeah, actually this is like a kind of proposal because I have seen this type of uh, issue coming like twice uh, in like recent days. I understand that earlier it, we discussed that it should be author's choice and like whatever category they want to put in either ERC or informational or any other category of EIP should be fine. I, I mean, I am just trying to understand, is there a way which can be helpful to authors to make a decision on that if they are a little confused or mm, not sure okay. of? Um, so for EIP, for core EIPs, it should be very clear. Like if it changes the consensus rules between the core clients and it's a core EIP. If it doesn't, then it's not a core EIP. Um, for ERC, if I remember correctly, I mean, it's been a while since I looked at EIP one, but um, I think for core EIPs, uh, or sorry, ERCs, it's pretty vague, right? Yeah, right. The confusion is between an informational and ERC, or maybe an ERC and an interface. So, like it was discussed last time, like RPC related and like API related can be an interface, but there are fine line and people sometimes get confused. Um, for interface, it's usually things like um, you're defining a, an interface, for lack of a better word, um, between two disparate systems. Like you've got um, two clients or two, a client and a server that are talking to each other, and you need a standardized interface between them because you have many to many relationship. So if you've got like, uh, the simple example is, um, like web browsers and web pages. You have many web browsers, you have many web pages. You want all the web pages to be able to talk to all the web browsers. And so you need to have a standard interface that they can communicate across that boundary. And so that standard interface would be like maybe the JavaScript API, standard JavaScript API for the browser. 
Um, and that would, you know, that's similar in the Ethereum ecosystem to the JSON RPC API, where you have many clients and then you have applications that many applications that all want to talk to those clients. And so again, you have many to many relationship and you are trying to define the communication protocol between things on one side of that relationship and things on the other side of that relationship. Um, ERC on the other hand is, um, more, I don't know, ERC is weird. ERC is basically like functionally, it's basically uh, standard contracts, like which arguably are usually interfaces. Um, but if it's a contract in the EVM, then it usually goes into ERC category. I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, right. Of course it helps. So yeah, uh, we are just trying to, you know, let people know that you can refer to EIP one, but uh, there are some corner cases where they get confused and they come for help. This EIP 3551 is one of those, although it's just a pull request as of now, uh, it hasn't been merged. Uh, so the author is trying to make it as informational and uh, it seems like more of an ERC. Um. So we are waiting on author's response. Uh, it oh, yeah. is this, like this, this is this is the ERC. This is definitely an ERC. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we are just waiting on uh, you know, the author's response. Uh, I, I suppose William left a comment, and so did Light Client, and we are waiting for his response. And if he's like strong into getting it informational, I'm not sure if there is other way. <laughs> Well, that was one of the case that uh, was discussed in the meeting yesterday. I wanted to like, you know, have a general opinion here. So that's all on the EIP ERC training uh, progress. The next uh, topic here is uh, JSON RPC API spec uh, progress update. Uh, I see Arita left some comment on the agenda. I know uh, you have some mic issue, uh, so I'm just reading out her comment on the chat. Jason RPC is the hidden bug at the moment. I'm hopeful I'll be off the project soon. More time for bots. <laughs> okay, so there are some changes going on in the process and like uh, uh, the status of this project is in question and uh, we are looking forward to understand what, what is the amount of work left to be done on this. Uh, it's not very clear at the moment. We hope to see some uh, responses from different team involved in this. Maybe we'll try to get back on the topic next week uh, or in the next meeting. Okay, um, that's all from the agenda. And uh, the last item on the agenda is uh, from the previous meeting. Uh, let's go quickly check if there is something that we need to do. Revisit the topic of version release process and documentation in three weeks. Can someone remind me what was that? I missed it. Okay, I'll look into it. Um, number two was put the limit account nonce EIP on the next all core dev agenda. Yeah, it was there. And the good thing is uh, the decision was quick. One went into the last call and the other one was withdrawn. So that was a good progress there. Document quick and wrong, just the way we like it. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> that was hanging for over six months and the decision was done like real quick. It, it was good. Sometimes we just need to like bring it to attention at the right time. Otherwise it will be shared yep. for another six months. I'm glad it's over. Yeah. So then the last decision here is document in EIP one and in the EIP template not to have authors put the EIP number in the title that was related to ERC proposals. And uh, the good thing is, yes, that has been updated. Uh, the EIP one template readme file, all these places have been updated with that. Uh, and uh, there is another change which uh, we discussed in the last meeting 
that was about uh, the uh, description section. So there is this change in adding the description um, and that will be uh, in the template itself. So exec has made the changes like on EIP one and the, the template itself. So that's another information for people who are looking into documenting proposals as a fresh like new proposals. And uh, that's all from the agenda item listed here. Anyone wants to bring up anything else? No. So I had this one question um, that I'm curious to understand. What do people generally think about this meeting in sense like, should we continue it bi-weekly and discuss these issues? And like, even if it is not uh, too full, it's fine, it's pretty light, it's fine, we can go early. Or do we want to have like a list of things to be discussed and have one meeting once a month that could be like 90 minutes or so? I feel like uh, we can probably do 60 minutes once a I mean, we can schedule it for 90 and, and be done earlier, but is there anything that like would stall too much if we only discuss it once a month? Not as long as people are active in the AP editors channel. I'm totally fine with using like Discord async communication. Um, yeah. In fact, I slightly prefer it. Uh, they, the problem always is getting people to engage. So if people are engaging regularly in the editor channel, then I'm totally fine with just using that even, or just having these just supplementary or once every month or whatever. We'll have to stop letting people just use the EAP editing channel as a chat room for finding core developers for their token forks. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm dollars an hour, man. <laughs> <laughs> if only I could code. Um. <laughs> if only this call wasn't recorded. Everybody else would have opinions. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I think once a month we can schedule it for ninety minutes, and worst case, cut it short. Um, does anyone disagree with that? Sounds good to me. Is, is everybody who shows up to these calls regularly in uh, both the Cat Herders EIP room and the uh, R&D EIP's room? The EIP Cat Herders room? is the one that's bridged to Telegram? Is that right? Um, uh, I don't believe no. so. No, oh, uh, no. I'm just posting you in the wrong place then because there's like an EIP. <laughs> in... <laughs> I mean, Are you, <laughs> did someone invite you to a scam channel and you're like, oh, this must be the EIP channel? <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's a EIP improved EIP improvement proposal HQ Telegram room. I don't know. Like, I mean, I don't post there a lot. That sounds like a scam. Yeah, Who just the admin? So it's her yeah. scam, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to blame you. So yeah, that was there when we didn't have this Discord channel in place. And like um, ever since uh, we have this ETH R&D Discord, uh, most of the thing is mostly discussed in EIP editing channel. However, we also have a channel on ECH Discord, like EIP editors, where we sometimes discuss some topics with like uh, which do not require like bigger audiences. So these are the two places where EIP editing or anything related to EIP is being discussed mostly. So yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I mean, I'm also fine either way. I, I was also good with like having twice a month, but like 30 minutes and like if, if it is 90 minutes or like have a bigger one is fine. I feel like we have made good progress in like past 20 months. When we started, we had a lot of issues, a lot of uh, like challenges now that we are getting clarity on that. And some of the issues are even brought up to the all core dev meeting. I find that uh, it's a good time that we can, we actually come up with a list of pr proposals or issues or challenges to get together and, you know, save everyone's time. So I'm happy to reschedulate any, any 
preference in that, like, you know, mid of the month or end of the month? We can start four weeks from now and then just have it every four weeks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's fine with me. Same. Uh, on a similar note, I, I'll be also curious about understanding how much engineering work is needed for like, you know, uh, EIP editing side. Do we see a good amount of work that, that we have done so far or what is the frequency that we could see? You're not looking hard enough. Uh, like I, I could I could keep an engineer busy forever basically so I, I think the bigger question is um, like what is the budget yeah right now we have we have like 20 hours sorry 40 hours a month we do and uh, yeah we have to go for further funding so I'm just curious like should that be fine or increase, decrease, whatever, what our bounty based or whatever you guys think would be helpful. I mean, I, we can take uh, whatever help we can get, I think is, is valuable. The, a slightly more interesting question might be, um, you know, do we, should the Ethereum Foundation or whoever is funding this allocate resources to improving the AP process versus other things in the ecosystem that need help? And that's, that's where things become a little more questionable. I do think there's some high value items in terms of just EIP management that we could benefit from. And most of those I think are already in Alita's to-do list like for the bot. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if Matt is successful in achieving his goals, we'll hopefully um, be kind of not entirely moving off the EIP system, but we'll be changing it significantly. Like whatever our process is will change significantly. And so we probably want to be careful about sinking too much engineering time into a process that hopefully is going away at some point in the future. I know there's a lot of vagueness in those statements. Yeah, I understand that. Like we have made good progress with the bots and if the process is going to be changing like, like in next six months to one year time, there's no point spending another six months in developing the bot that we know that will not be helpful. So yeah. yeah. I, I do think I do think there is at least value, um, regardless of what happens, in at least handling a few of the kind of top items on Alita's bot improvement list. Um, things like making it so when an editor approves the IP, it will get merged and um, making it so when an editor authors an EIP, they need another editor to approve. Um, little things like that, that hopefully will be relatively small tasks, um, but pretty significant quality of life improvements for us, I think. You think the EIP bot, the GitHub, where like bot is, um, codes are there, issue section of that would be a good place for like people to report something and Alita can pick it up from there? Um, sure, or the bot repo itself. I don't remember where that's at. Alita probably has a link. Um, it's probably the better place. Is if you have a feature request or a bug with the bot, probably the right places in that repo. Yeah, right. Ethereum uh, slash EIP dash bot. I think we can make good use of the issue section there and like keep on adding if there is an issue and you know people want it to be fixed. So uh, from this, uh, is it safe to assume that whatever time uh, is being allocated for engineering work, like 40 hours a month is okay and we can continue doing that for another three to six months um, if there is no significant change? I think we're all on the same page. Yeah, that's good. That's helpful. No, because now this is the time that we should start looking for like another three to six months. So I was just curious to collect thoughts and feedbacks and start looking into options. 
So that's all for the items listed on the agenda today. And we are almost at time. So yeah, thank you everyone. Unless anyone has any final comment or thoughts on any topic. Nope, I'm sleep deprived. So I'm gonna keep my mouth shut since this is recorded. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to reschedule this meeting like on uh, uh, four weeks from now, and we'll update the invite accordingly. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one. See ya. Thanks, everybody.